No, thank you. No. No, no. No. Get it out of here. Get it out of here. Charles Darwin. Sí, yeah. sí, sí. Captain Fitzroy. Sí, sí, Me sí. soy naturalista. Hey, hueso. Hueso, hueso. Boom, hueso. boom. Sí, hueso, hueso. Sí, sí, sí. hueso gigante. 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 Sí, sí, aquí, sí, aquí, yeah. Sí, sí, yo paso aquí, aquí están los huesos. Aquí están. Fitzroy. A flood washed down part of a bank of earth. Mi hijo le, le pegó por una piedra y le sacó los dientes. Por eso que se caí tan afuera. It was perfect, but the boys knocked out some of the teeth throwing stones at it. How much? Quanto costa? Rifle. 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 I wonder why these creatures no longer exist. Perhaps the ark was too small to allow them entry and they perished in the flood. <laughs> what is there to laugh at? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Do you mock me or the Bible? Oh, neither. What sort of clergyman will you be, Mr. Darwin? Dreadful. Dreadful. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth. Hello. Which the water what are you doing here? Why such beauty when no one can see? And every winged fowl after his kind. You can't have been blown here. And God saw that it was good. <laughs> If I were to give a prize for the single best idea anybody ever had, I'd give it to Darwin for the idea of natural selection. Ahead of Newton, ahead of Einstein, because his idea unites the two most disparate features of our universe. The world of purposeless, meaningless matter and motion on the one side, and the world of meaning and purpose and design on the other. He understood that what he was proposing was a truly revolutionary idea. The Darwinian revolution is about who we are. It's what we're made of. It's what our life means insofar as science can answer that question. So it, in many ways, was the singularly deepest and most discombobulating of all discoveries that science has ever made. In Darwin's day, the idea of evolution was regarded as highly unorthodox because it went against all of natural history in Great Britain. It jeopardized the standing of science. It did jeopardize the standing of a stable society, the Bible, and the church as well. Darwin kept his thoughts to himself for many years and agonized over the problem. If it ever got out that he was doing something that ran slap counter to established science, would ruin his career, ruin his reputation. He was a respectable man with a dangerous theory. You never get your sea legs. Not once in five years. Whenever the sea was up, so is the contents of my stomach. What a delightful thought. 
We should be able to squeeze 400 a year out of the governor. Why? What's he said? He hasn't said anything, but I've seen it in his eyes, the way he pored over your letters. A very proud father. I told him you were going to publish a journal of your travels. There was a definite flicker of interest. <laughs> publish? Yes, of course. No country parsonage for you, my boy. You're under my wing now. I'll take charge of your affairs, introduce you to all my clever, witty friends, trade on your, your celebrity. Celebrity? Certainly, everyone wants to meet you. Hear stories of naked Tahitian women and giant sloves or whatever. Captain Fitzroy, this is my brother, Erasmus. Mr. Darwin. Captain. Good God. A man can collect a lot of rubbish in five years. It's a wonder you didn't sink the ship, Charles. Named, I take it, after your grandfather? Yes, and an uncle who drowned himself in the River Derwent. And are you a free thinker like him? I'm more of a free drinker, really. And how was the voyage for you, Captain? That's not for me to say. No? Forty views of the coast as seen from the sea, 80 plans of harbours and 82 coastal maps. All for the hydrographic department of the Admiralty. Bravo. Dinner at sea must have been a jolly affair. Yeah. From the Galapagos Islands. <laughs> Humor roasted over an open fire. Rather like veal. <laughs> Armadillo roasted in its shell. A lot like duck. Tortoise, of course. <laughs> Some of them weigh as much as 500 pounds. One I measured was uh, 96 inches around the waist. If one of them ever needs a suit of clothes, we must send it to Father's Tailor. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Uh, llama? Ostrich? <laughs> People wonder how it is some animals come to be extinct. Now we have the answer. Eaten by Charlie Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> you look as though you're going to the scaffold. Dignity. Poise. Smile. Remember, all eyes are on you. The judging has begun. Mr. President, my lords, ladies and gentlemen. No, no, no. Start with a bang. Men of Athens. What? Friends, Romans, countrymen, that sort of thing. Right. I can't do this. Yes, you can. You mustn't let the fact that every leading geologist in the land will be there put you off. God. And let me hear an interesting bit. There aren't any. The earthquake. Oh, stand still. And don't wave your arms around like that. Leave your tie alone. Don't squint. And speak up. The earthquake ran for 400 miles along the coast, accompanied by the simultaneous eruption of a line of volcanoes. We found fresh mussel beds lying above high tide. The shellfish all dead. The land had risen eight feet. Mountains must be the product of thousands and thousands of such rises occurring again and again throughout history. Even at the very crest of the Andes, we found marine remains the fossilized shells of creatures that once crawled about at the bottom of the sea, elevated nearly 14,000 feet above its level. Time, unimaginable tracts of time, is the key. Darwin. Splendid. Thank you. Well Thank you very much. <laughs> Congratulations. Interesting paper. Oh, thank you. Where have you placed your fossil specimens? Well, I was thinking of the British Museum. Ah. You're happy to have them languish in some dusty Bloomsbury cellar? No, not at all. You'd better let me look over them for you, then. We'll let you know. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Tom Pazoff. 
Who does he think he is? He thinks he's Richard Owen, the most brilliant anatomist in And Europe. you're Erasmus Darwin's little brother, Darwin of the Beagle Darwin. Lord it while you can. I don't want to lord it. Liar. What a brilliant red. Brighter than the actual plumage. I try to allow for the loss of colour that comes with death. And can you do this with my Galapagos birds? Well, I haven't finished identifying them yet, Mr. Darwin. I do know that your wren is a finch. Your gross beak is a finch. Even your blackbird is a finch. And they're unique, all new, never described before. There's even evidence that there are separate species for each Galapagos island. But, but I didn't label mine by island. You didn't label them by island. <laughs> Why do you want them? Why, well, I told you. I failed to label mine by island. No, no, I, uh, I mean, why are the birds I collected suddenly of such interest to you? Well, the vice governor of the Galapagos told me he could identify which island a tortoise came from by its markings. Yes, yes, small variations are possible from island to island, adaptations to climate and so on. Yes, but the islands all have the same climate. My expert, John Gould, tells me he's found different species of finches. What if these finches were blown to the Galapagos from South America and then began to change, adapt, if you will, become more and more different from their ancestors generation after generation? First into varieties, then into new species. Each new species marooned on its own island. What are you talking about? What if the finches were blown to the Galapagos? God put those creatures there. <laughs> that makes no sense. Why would God put different birds on almost identical islands? I have no idea. It's not a question that requires an answer. Species were commanded into existence by God. They're perfect forms, and they've been perfect since the day of creation. It's divine law, God's will. I'll see to it that your expert receives my birds. Thank you. It's God you should give thanks to. Come on. Tonight, and for one night only, ladies and gentlemen, a guided tour of Charles Darwin's boneyard. Shh. Oh, for goodness sake, and yes. hurry up. Yes. This is a large, extinct, llama-like creature. And this is a giant ground sloth, discovered by Mr. Darwin at Punta Alta. Lastly. The remains of Mr. Darwin's breakfast. This skull belongs to a huge rodent. A relative of the South American capybara. If that's the size of a rat, imagine how big the cats must have been. <laughs> I have named it Toxodon. Thank you, thank you, Professor Owen, for identifying and describing the extraordinary array of fossils discovered by Mr. Darwin on his voyage to South America. <laughs> we allow the planets and the sun to be governed by natural laws. But the smallest insect we wish to be created by a special act of God. <laughs> Surely the creation of life has to be explained in the same way as geology, using natural, ordinary, everyday causes. <laughs> well, in theory, yes, but in practice there can be no question about the prime cause. Divine will. Shouldn't men of science be free to investigate each and every means by which new species come into being? If by that you mean wild accusations about man's ancestry, the answer is no. To destroy man's unique status is to open the floodgates to anarchy. You might just as well throw muskets to the rabble. Oh. <laughs> People like...